Here at the 2019 Dubai Muscle Show with eight-time Mr. Olympia Ronnie Coleman, by many estimation, the best bodybuilder of all time. Now, Ronnie, I read your book on the flight over here from New York to Dubai, read it from back to, from front to back, and there were a lot of stories there that I wonder if you have shared in the past. I'm gonna go from the very beginning. You grew up in a small town in Louisiana where you talked about how in the midst of racism in the country, in the midst of turning times, you were in a town that was sort of isolated. You had a very simple upbringing. Talk to us a little bit about that, the, the origins, the beginning of Ronnie Coleman. Yeah, well, I was from a real small town. There was, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, we didn't have a lot of racism and stuff like that. Uh, for the most part, you know, we're just uh, going through our day-to-day -day operations as we were told pretty much by our parents. So, you know, I uh, had a, a mom that uh, encouraged me to do good in school, good at everything that I did. And I've always had a lot of energy uh, along the way. Uh, I started working when I was about 10 years old in a small store there in our town, making about a quarter a day. I got to the point where I was uh, making a dollar a day. It was $2. And then they started paying me weekly, like $20. And I worked this whole job until I graduated college. So I worked it all my, throughout my high school year. I had uh, other jobs along the way. You know, being from a small town, you try to do things to keep yourself out of trouble. So I, I played football, I ran track, I was on the powerlifting team. I started powerlifting when I was about 15 years old. Uh, uh, my mom was always there. Uh, we, we were pretty much family thing. Uh, after a while, you know, my mom had me to go stay with my grandmother, so to, she to she didn't have somebody to protect her and look after her. She was real, real old at the time, so I stayed with my grandmother for pretty much my whole high school uh, years. Uh, uh, after, uh, you know, graduating high school, I went to uh, college. Uh, Grandma Rambling, State University, yeah. Grandma State University where I played football for four years. I uh, majored in accounting, I graduated with honors there. Along the, long, long the time, along my time there, I worked for the big department there. Uh, I was the uh, sports editor for the Grammy Night, which is the college newspaper there. So I, I've, I've done a, a lot of things along the way, and I've been involved with a lot of uh, activities, a lot of programs. So I had a lot of fun, I enjoyed myself. I ended up graduating in 1986 with a Degree in accounting, graduated with honors there. From there, uh, I had a friend that uh, had a job uh, in Dallas, Texas. At the time, uh, you know, I was playing football, I was looking for to get uh, drafted. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about that because I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you walked on to Grambling State. Now that's a Division One, so it's top yeah. level college football, yeah. and. Not only did you walk on, but eventually you earned a place as the starting middle linebacker. And not only that, but you had scouts from the Philadelphia Eagles telling yeah, you yeah. they were going to draft you. So, and then you suffered an injury. I think it was yeah. the first yeah. week of your senior year. Yeah. Had that not have you were trying to sack a quarterback and you injured your neck. Yeah. your neck. Had that not happened, would that have altered bodybuilding history? Would you have gone on to become an NFL linebacker? Um, it's like this. God has a plan for each and every one of us. Uh, I tried uh, to go on and do that, but it never worked out. So I just took what, what I had and, and, ran, and ran with that. And all I had at the time was a uh, college degree. So I figured, you know, if, it, if I didn't make it in the NFL, I could make it in, in the uh, accounting world. I applied with some of the biggest firms in, uh, in the United States. I uh, went on a lot of interviews and never got hired. So I ended up working at uh, Domino's Pizza uh, like three three months after I got to Texas. And, and you said that Domino's saved your life. Pretty much, because <laughs> I didn't have anything going on at the time. And I had a car, I had bills actually, you know, I had car note rent and all that kind of stuff. So I had to take something to, uh, to support myself, and that was the first thing that came along. Uh, while I was there, I was trying to get a job in accounting the whole entire time. I worked Domino from 87 all the way to 89. Uh, I kind of finally gave up, you know, two years into it. And uh, the only thing 
the only people that were hired was the police department that you didn't have to have experience, you know. They have, and having a college degree, you can't get experience, you know, I didn't it, but nobody ever gave me a job along the way. So the police department didn't require experience, so I applied at uh, two or three departments and I finally got hired on at Arlington. I, I just wanted to point out in the in the book, you mentioned that it was the best job ad that you ever saw because it said no experience required. Yeah, exactly, because every job that I apply for wants you to have experience, and if you can't get experience, you can't get a job. So the police department didn't, didn't require that. And then obviously you had all sorts of, you took the test. There was one situation where they told you that if you had to get up, you would fail the test. You had to go to the bathroom and you yeah, failed the test. I, I applied it. The first department I applied it, uh, I think I missed a couple. By a point, by yeah. Two, two points. So I went to the next uh, department, and while I was sitting there taking the test, I had to use the bathroom, and I was like, hey, uh, can I go to the bathroom? He's like, well, get up and leave, uh, that's it. I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's it, because <laughs> I ain't about to do the deal. So I got up left, and then uh, that was it on that one. The third one I applied to was all this police department. And of course, it was an extensive background check, but finally got the job. Let's go back to the origins of you as a bodybuilder. Remember in the book specifically you mentioned that the musty smell of the gym, the humidity of the gym, is what made you fall in love with lifting and you just enjoyed the passion of lifting. You, they talk to us about how you first fell in love with lifting and eventually the bodybuilding. That's a real simple one. When I was like 12, 13 years old, people always asked me if I worked out. I was very muscular at the time, and I always told him no. So I got to wondering what would happen. What would happen if I really started working out? So I started working out and fell in love with it right away. And uh, when I got to high school, the guy, well, actually, when I was in junior high, the guy said, "Hey, when you get to high school, we're gonna put you on the powerlifting team." I'm like, "Yeah, I, I, I look forward to doing that. I, I can't wait to get to high school." So when I got to high school, I joined the powerlifting team. You know, did a lot of powerlifting meets. Uh, didn't do, didn't do so well, you know, but I had fun. That was, that was the most important thing about it. Well, I'm trying to remember his name. You mentioned it specifically in the book. Um, there was a power lifter, a decorated power lifter, and he said to you flat out that if you made it your mission to become a power lifter, to really dedicate yourself to power lifting, that you could have been the greatest body, the power, build, power lifter of all time. Did you ever really give serious consideration to becoming a professional power lifter? No, never, because I was just doing it for the fun of it. I, I, I never aspired to be a uh, like a professional powerlifter or nothing like that. But like I said, I was in high school at the time, so it, I'm, I'm just worried about trying to graduate high school and, and not, uh, you know, so much as being a professional powerlifter. My thing back then was pretty much trying to be as good as I possibly could be in football because uh, I, I had. Uh, a lot of fun playing football, and that was my passion, right? Back in those days, powerlifting, you know, something I did on the side. But I had so much fun doing it, you know, so I, I was kind of like try, trying to be the best powerlifter I could be and trying to be the best football player I could be, but I, I had more passion at the time for football. Let's get into the part where you eventually you get into bodybuilding. You talked about joining the police force, and it's funny because you took the upbringing that you had, you were always a worker, and even while you were working on the police force, they allowed you to train for free, so that was great. Then you worked as a handyman in your apartment complex, so you lived there for free. You took part-time shifts at a gas station, so you got gas for free, and you enjoyed that. But then, you came across a situation where you were introduced to Metroplex Gym and its owner, Brian Thompson. Well, I never really worked at a gas station, but I did work at, uh, Denny's, <laughs> got free food. I worked at uh, a boot store called Western Warehouse, got a lot of free pair of boots. I got like 10, 15 pair of boots. And then uh, one day while I was working a call, one of the guys that worked at Metroplex said, hey, where are you working out at? I'm like, I'm working at the station. He's like, oh man, that's just wild. You need to come over here. You know, Metroplex gym. I'm like, okay. So I go to the gym the next day with him and uh, the owner, who owned the time, Ryan Brian Dawson, Dawson. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, man, most of the time I had 23 inch arm, you know, decent legs and stuff. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I've never been a bodybuilder before in my life. He said, uh, you need to think of bodybuilding, you could probably, uh, you know, number one bodybuilder in the world. I'm like, no, 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 dude, I just want to work with a piece of art, I want to do a 
doing it. I came here just to, you know, for my friend asked me to come here and work out because they said we had more weight than they had the station. Well, I, <laughs> we went back and forth for like three or four days and, and, and uh, him trying to convince me to be a, a, a bodybuilder. And I never wanted to be one because, you know, I worked for Peace Park and I heard those guys not to be on strict diets, take all these steroids and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. He's like, well, man, you probably be pretty good. I'll tell you what, he said, uh, I give you a free membership to the gym if you compete in this show coming up in a couple months. I'm like, the, the oh, Texas I'm State Cup, right? Uh, Mr. Texas. Mr. Texas, right. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, I give you a free membership to the gym if you compete in Mr. Texas. I'm like, okay, and, you know, you should play with that, you know. <laughs> So I uh, took the free membership and uh, he taught me how to pose, how to diet, and went to Mr. Texas and I won first and overall there. So you fell in love with the sport at what point? Because he, he had you training, bodybuilding training, which I guess was a new experience for you. Then he taught you the art of posing. He had you eating chicken and rice five to six times a day. Yeah. But you mentioned in the book that specifically you fell in love with the art of posing. Was there somebody, and you mentioned how you looked up to Lee Haney, was there a bodybuilder, maybe it was Lee Haney, that you looked at and you were like, I want to flow like them on the stage? I mean, I was, yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> I, was in, yeah, I was inspired by all those guys back then because I, I didn't think I could you know, attain that level of muscularity and size, so I was inspired by all of them. So Lee Haney was Miss Olympia at the time, so, uh, more inspired by him than anybody. But uh, Brian, I kind of like fell in love with him because Brian showed me how to do it the right way and how to do it the fun way. So I enjoyed it and I fell in love with it right away. Like I said, my first show I won first and overall. So I was having fun getting the free membership to the gym. So everything about bodybuilding was all positive. positive. Check, check, check. So then eventually you become a pro bodybuilder, and in the beginning few shows that you did, I believe you did the night of the night of champions, which is now known as the New York Pro, yeah. Chicago Pro. Yeah. Your placings obviously they weren't there. No. Then came the night in Russia. So a very well known story, the Russian Grand Prix, and you've always been someone who has said to himself, be it football, be it in life, be it in bodybuilding, that you want to learn from the best. You go to Kevin Lebroni late at night, one of the nights, you go to his room, you asked him, Kevin, what's the secret? What am I doing wrong? And he says what? Or shows you what? <clears throat> well, Kevin is the second guy I went to. The first guy I went to was Flex Wheeler. Flex was winning all those two shows just like Kevin was. And I went to uh, Flex one night, like, Dude, what are you doing to win all these shows? They're like, man, I, 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 I gotta tell you that, uh, if you want to be with the big dogs, you got to get on the porch. I'm like, what do you mean by that? And they're like, well, uh, you, uh, you you claiming all this drug free stuff, but uh, you know, if you want to be uh, a real good guy, you got to you got to do what we're doing. And I'm like, so what are y'all guys doing? And he's like, well, you know, we're, we're doing. Uh, back then, uh, it's been so long ago, I don't remember exactly, but he was telling me. But he's like, uh, I got a friend of mine that. Can, that can help you out. And, Chad uh, he, Nichols, correct? No, 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 this was another guy. Chad came like, this was in 94. Chad came like in 98. This guy, uh, he helped me out. This, this guy, and he helped me out. In 95, I won my first pro show. In Canada, correct? Yeah, yeah. In 96, I won it again. So in 97, when I was on tour with Kevin, I was getting third, fourth, fifth, and all these shows, and Kevin was winning. We had, we had, uh, Seven shows in 11 days. In the last show, I'm like, man, I'm tired of losing to those things. So I'm gonna do with uh, Kevin what I did with Flex. So I went to Kevin, and I'm like, man, what are you doing to win all these shows? And like, you wanna know what I'm doing? I'm like, yeah. So he goes to his coffee maker, he pulls out a cup, pour it in uh, coffee in there, then he goes to the refrigerator. Uh, they had these real small bottles of vodka. And he grabbed one of those and poured it in there with the coffee. He's like, you, you want to know what I'm doing? This is what I'm doing. So he put the two together and he's like, drink this. I'm like, man, I don't drink vodka, but uh, <laughs> I guess I'll do anything, you know, just to, you know, play better. So 
So I, I, I drank what he had, I drank the vodka and the coffee, and the next day I beat Kevin at, at, at the uh, 97 Russian Grand Prix. And, and Kevin never beat me again after that. For those who have <laughs> never heard this story of how coffee and vodka was the difference, you, yeah. you mentioned in the book how you drank that combination, and then you looked in the mirror, and, and it just seemed as if you're you're transforming it right in front of your eyes. Right in front of my eyes. O overnight, you know, and uh, the next morning when I, when I wake up, I look a whole lot better. So I went to the show the next day, and uh, I beat Kevin at that show, and, and then the rest is history for the most part. Well, I want to take a step back real quick, because again, for those who are not aware, and we'll take a step back, you were on the doorstep, potentially, if not for the injury, of being an NFL player. And then in your early days, yeah. there are pictures of you in your book from your early bodybuilding yeah. days. And you just take one look and, and again, you want to say genetics, whatever you want yeah. to say. You had that freakish look very early on. And then we talk about your speed, your strength, your agility as a football player. Yeah, I was talking to Dave yeah. Palumbo about this. and. He made the comparison that you were essentially like a Bo Jackson. Did you ever see yourself as a Bo Jackson in terms of your versatility as an athlete and eventually as a bodybuilder? No, no way. I was just <laughs> trying to be the best I possibly could be in the position I was playing at the time. I was playing middle linebacker. So I was trying to be the best middle linebacker that I could be. And I, I did pretty good. Like I said, I worked my way up, became starter, you know, from, on, on the depth chart. So um, once I. After that, you know, I, like I say, I would I talk to some scouts, and, you know, and uh, they were saying that they were going to be watching me. Uh, you know, I, I went out and played, and I ended up getting injured in one of the games, and, and uh, it took me out of the starting role, so I didn't play hardly any the rest of the season because of that. So when the season was over, and I didn't hear from anybody, and I'm like, okay, well, this is, this is not meant, meant to be. Well, obviously, it was meant to be in bodybuilding, and we talk about the late 90s. Obviously, there was a transition between Dorian Yates and yourself. Now, Dorian, sort of, you mentioned this, he ushered in that era of the mass monster. He essentially changed what bodybuilding looked like at the top of the bodybuilding division. Now, when you were crowned in 1998, you specifically mentioned how you were not expecting it. You mentioned some of the names, obviously Flex Wheeler, Kevin Lavroni, um, uh, Mike Monterazzo even in that list. You know, some of the greats that you surpassed in order to win your first Olympia. Take us back to the night. When you were crowned, your first thought was what? Well, I gotta go back a little bit further than that because the uh, way it happened is uh, Flex was Getting ready for the Olympia. I was getting ready for the United Champions in uh, the Canada. So I won the uh, United Champions, I won the Canada. And before I won those shows, Fleck came to me and said, like, Dude, uh, I got this new guy I'm working with. I think he can do, you know, uh, I think he can do wonders for your physique. And then and I asked him his name, he said, His name is Chad Nicholson. He said, I, I give you his number, you call him, I'm quite sure he'll help you out. So he gave me Chad's number, I called him. Chad never called me back, I was, so I called Flex. I said, called this guy and he never called me back. It's like, hey, you gotta keep calling him. So I called him again, he finally called me back, and we started working together. Uh, like I said, I won the, I won the uh, Canada, I you know, beat Kevin there, and then I won the, went to the next, next week I went to the United Champions, I beat Kevin there. And then uh, <clears throat> after, the show after that was gonna be the Mr. Olympia. So uh, going into the Miss Olympia, I was just trying to try my best to place in the top five. Year before I got ninth, year before that I got seventh. So uh, my goal was to make the top five. So going into the show, that was all I was thinking about, you know, and uh, I had no idea that I was gonna do as good as I did. But you know, I trained hard, dieted hard, prepared myself be first like I do in every other show that I competed in. But I never, my expectations were top five, nothing else. Well, when uh, they got down to number three, you know, I, I just knew they were gonna call my name there, and they didn't. So left standing on the stage was, was uh, me and Flex, so 
I knew for sure I was guaranteed second place. Because leading up to the show, everybody had already told Flex he was going to win, and you know, he had already uh, accepted uh, uh, his to all over the world that you know, he's going to be the next Miss Olympia. So in my mind, you know, I'm thinking second place is mine. But when the, <laughs> when the guy said, uh, Flex Wheeler, my initial thought was he'd made a mistake. But uh, I'm like, no, they don't make mistakes on this stage. <laughs> so my next initial thought was, I don't know what to do now. So I think I kind of collapsed. Yeah, I think you mentioned in your book, you just sort of dropped your knees and you yeah. didn't quite know how to react. Now, Flex Wheeler, you mentioned very high praise for him as a competitor. You know, yeah. people talk about you and Jay Cutler and, and that being the best rivalry in bodybuilding history. When you look back at you and Flex Wheeler, and obviously when Flex didn't win, he, yeah. he, he stormed off the stage, Kevin Lebroni had to bring him back. <laughs> Do you look at that and maybe not equate it to you and, and, and Jay, but, but look at that as a top bodybuilding rivalry? You know, I never, I never got into the rivalry thing because I was always thinking about myself because I knew I could control what I looked like. I, I, and, and then I knew I couldn't control what the other guys looked like. So I was always, uh, uh, the rivalry was always within me because I knew I could get on stage and be the best that I possibly could be. I knew I could train hard, diet hard, make all the sacrifices that I had to make. And, and, and I knew I could bring the best package that, that I could bring to the stage, but I knew I, I didn't know what the other guys could do. So I was always concerned with me. I was always uh, at a uh, competition uh, with myself. I was always trying to be the best that I possibly could be. Like when I won my first Olympia, my thing going into the second one was, if I could do, replicate what I did to, to win the first one, I could probably win the second one. So I pretty much did this, the same thing, you know, died the same way, but I also trained harder. <laughs> died a little bit harder. Because I, I like, I mean, I got this thing, so I gotta continue to be Miss Olympia. If I wanna be Miss Olympia, I gotta, you know, be better and do better. You mentioned that in your book specifically, how there are champions, and you mentioned other sports as well. You mentioned the Dallas Cowboys, obviously you living in Dallas, yeah. and how there is a level of complacency that comes into a champion sometimes that they don't have that same level of intensity to repeat as champions. What motivated you from the first one, and obviously once the ball started rolling, it started rolling, but in the first title defense, what was that biggest motivating factor for you? The biggest motivating factor for me was always to be as good as I possibly could, always train as hard as I possibly could, always die as hard as I possibly could, always make the sacrifices that I needed to make because, like I said, I could always control how I look, but I could never control how the other guys look. So I was always, always uh, focused on me, myself, and I. When you look back at that era of bodybuilders, when we talk about Kevin Lebroni, we talk about Flex Wheeler, we talk about Chris Cormier, Nasser, and you consider who some of your top, your, your stiffest rivals were, or maybe not rivals, competition rather, early in your run as Mr. Olympia. Flex Wheeler aside, who would you say your toughest, your top threat was to your Olympia title? I would have to go with, uh, it's, it's hard to say, it's really hard to say. Because I never even looked at the other guys. I always looked at myself. But Flex, I knew, you know, he was uh, kind of like destined to be Mr. Olympia. He was always uh, given, the, given that because he had that, that massive uh, physique with, with the greatest, you know, portion, greatest shape that, that ever had been out there at the time. So, I would guess that Flex Guido would probably be the guy that he, uh, he would, who would ascend to the throne if it wouldn't, wouldn't have been for me. Let's talk about the end of the run. Now, 2006 Olympia, correct? Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. You were going for Sandow number nine. 
Yeah. And then comes along Jay Cutler, and he wins. Now, you mentioned this in your book. I'm not sure if you've really publicly spoken about this before, but if I you can expand upon this, you essentially say that you felt as if you were the best bodybuilder on that stage, but that the powers that be felt that it was time for a change and that they were not going to give it to you, despite the fact that you, in your opinion, you were the best on that stage at that time. If you could expand upon that. Well, uh, like I said, I always trained to be number one. I always thought I could be uh, number one when I, when I got up on stage because I prepared, like I said, as, as, as hard as I did the year before. So I, in my mind, I'm, 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 I'm going to win. Uh, and it was like that until I think we went up on stage for the final pose down. Uh, I, 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 somebody had word to me that uh, you're not going to win this one. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, yeah, they've already made up in their mind that you know, Jay is, is, is the guy who's going to win. That Jay is the guy who uh, they're favorite, more famous towards. You, uh, you know, been on this long run and change is always good. This is this is what was told to me right before I went on for the final hold down. But up until then, you know, in my mind, I had won the show. So in my mind, you know, I was gonna be win, win my ninth point. But like I said, I had already I I had already prepared to be number one nine. I've always done uh, you know what I did the year before. To be in the position that I was in, it wasn't until, like I said, that final pose down that I had told, I was told that I, you know, they were going in a different direction. So at, at that stage, you know, that nothing could be done. Now, in the, in the book, you specifically mentioned that you feel as if because there were bodybuilders that great bodybuilders yeah. that at that point yeah. were tired, and that the sport in and of itself needed a spark, and you felt that that change was needed, in your opinion, uh, that that's why they made that decision. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the main reason why I think they did. That's, that was a, that's what I was pretty much told to. Let's talk about that era that you competed in, the eight championship titles. When you look back at that run, you talk about how you were singularly focused on yourself, you didn't look at your competition, you didn't consider them rivals, because you were so focused just on bringing your absolute best. Yeah. When you reflect back upon your eight title run, what are some of the biggest keys that you say to yourself, this is why I was an eight time champion? Uh, I'm gonna attribute to my work, work ethic, you know, I, I always, you know, I got it real hard, uh, I always trained real hard, I always gave it my all, I always gave 100% in everything that I did. I always made all those sacrifices, you know, not to go out and hang out. I always did what, what was expected to do, what was expected of me to do, to become, you know, the champion the next year, the year after that, the year after that. So I, I've always put my best foot forward and tried to expand on being the best that I possibly could be, and then uh, try to be better the next year. So I, I never really enjoyed, you know, winning those championships because after I won the first one, you know, I set my sights on the on the second one. Then after I won my second one, I set my sights on winning the third. So it was always a constant mode of winning and winning and winning, and doing what I had to do to get the next one. I have to ask because in the book. You specifically mentioned how when people think about your legacy, you have a perception that some people are only going to remember the loss and then it's sort of the end of your career because that's what people do. They don't they don't remember the good times, they remember the bad times. First of all, I would go as far as to say that I just feel as if bodybuilding fans in general consider you right up there, right up there with the Lee Haney's of the world. But when you think about your legacy in bodybuilding, what is it? Well, I, I won eight uh, titles. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I did a, a real good job. I think I focused real hard on uh, winning. Uh, I, I th think I, I tried to improve on what I did the year before and, and be, to be better for the next year. So I, my legacy is, 
In your words, what made Ronnie Coleman the greatest bodybuilder of all time? Well, that's the, you know, that's, that's one of those things that's debatable. So I always leave that up to the people that, you know, debate that. For me, I always just try to be the best I possibly could be on that particular day. A funny story, if we're going to take a little detour. You, uh, it was, I believe, in 1997 at the Ironman Pro. Yeah. Lee Priest finished ahead of you, and he would eventually finish ahead of you at that year's Olympia as well. And you specifically mentioned in the book how Lee had this sort of sinister smile as if he knew he was going to finish ahead of you. It's a funny story because obviously, for those who are going to be watching RX Muscle, very familiar with Lee and his sense of humor. Talk about that moment and your perception of Lee as a competitor. Lee's always been a real good guy, so I that. I truly respect him because he, he had a phenomenal physique. But you know, in my mind, you, you know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm 5'11 and you know, got a lot of mass, big, real big guy. And I look over at Lee, he's about, you know, all, all the five, five foot two, five foot two. <laughs> Maybe uh, half of the weight that I was, but he was a phenomenal uh, competitor. But he was beating me, and I'm like, I ain't the guy that, 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 that size of beat a guy my size. And I'm like, well, maybe this ain't the sport for me. And at one point, you know, uh, you know, I, I, after he had beat me at the Ironman, he was beating me the next week at the uh, Arnold Classic. And I'm thinking, okay, uh, it's time for me to, you know, pretty much hang it up. <laughs> I looked over at the, at the girl I was with and uh, told her that, you know, I was done. She's like, boy, oh, shut up. And I thought about, I thought to myself, wait a minute, if I quit bodybuilding, I lose my free membership to the gym. And uh, that's as far as it went right there. <laughs> when you look back at your football career, powerlifting, and obviously your long run in bodybuilding, the common denominator was that you had the injuries within your neck, within your back, and back injuries, which you mentioned, started from a very early age. Obviously, you had to put your body through a lot, a lot. And obviously, there was a price when it comes to greatness, when it comes to being, in many words, the greatest bodybuilder of all time. When you look back at that and you consider you know, what you're dealing with today, do you sit back and reflect and say to yourself, it was worth it? It was worth it, and then a little bit more. I just tell somebody just a few minutes ago, if I had it to do all over again, I'd probably do it exactly the same. The exact same, same way, there, there was nothing, there was nothing that I would change. Let's get a quick thought on you, from you, on today's bodybuilding. Obviously there is constant comparison between your era and today's era. You look back at this previous Olympia, Brandon Curry winning, what did you think of Brandon Curry as the 15th Mr. Olympia? Well, people don't understand how hard we have to work to, to, to get to who we are. People don't understand how hard you have to work to be a Mr. Olympia. There's a lot of sacrifices, there's a lot of dedication, there's a lot of uh, training, a lot of hiding. And, and when you are in that, you know, you, you're thinking to yourself, is this really worth it? And what, once you win that ultimate prize, that pretty much answers your question. So to me, you know, every era is, is, is an era of its own. But regardless of what your era is, you have to work, you have to die, you have to make all those sacrifice, sacrifices. And when you win that ultimate prize, it's all well worth it. Finally, Ronnie, uh, in the book, the book is entitled, Yeah, Buddy, correct? Yeah. My Incredible Story. So Blood, Sweat, and Muscles. In the book, you mentioned the, the, your, your catchphrases. Yeah, buddy, lightweight, nothing but a peanut, peanut, nothing to it but to do it. And it's funny because the, people say those quotes, but I'm not sure if everybody realizes these are things that you... Yeah, these are things that, that I would say when I was bored. Because <laughs> most, for the most time, part, I, you know, I trained train by myself and I was looking for ways to find myself up. So I would say these sayings get me going, and for the most part, they worked out pretty good. One last one, at the end of the book, you talked about Ronnie's life lessons for bodybuilding and for life. 
encapsulating all of those in your mind, when somebody asks you what are your life lessons for bodybuilding and life, what do you tell them? Train as hard as you possibly can, but the most important thing you gotta do, you gotta find somebody that's very knowledgeable. Knowledgeable. Because knowledge is power. The more you have, the better you're gonna be. And that that's my that, that, that was my key to success to uh, success. And I always advise other people to, to do it the same way. Ladies and gentlemen, eight-time Mr. Olympia, Ronnie Coleman. Yeah, buddy. The greatest of all time. Hey, wait.